One possible answer is suggested by other fossils found near it. There are large predatory fish about 10 to 15 feet long living alongside Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik was prey. To survive, it had few choices. You can get big, you can get armor, or you can get out of the way. Shubin thinks Tiktaalik got out of the way. With those arm-like fins, it could have dragged itself to safety on land or in the shallows. But this was only half the answer. What it doesn't show us is the actual genetic mechanism, the genetic recipe that builds a fin into that which builds a limb. At 375 million years old, Tiktaalik's DNA had vanished long ago. Shubin needed a next of kin, a fish relative that was still alive. What we needed was a creature that was in the right part of the evolutionary tree, but also a fish that has a very fleshy fin. So the search was on. A number of fish fit the bill, but Shubin favored one in particular, the paddlefish. Paddlefish is a really weird fish. They develop this really long snout, and they're really voracious. They eat each other. So oftentimes, you'll lose a lot of your fish when they swim together uh, because they'll eat each other. Living in the shallow waters of the Mississippi, it's also a living fossil. Scientists have spent years working out the relationships between different species of fish, and they know that the paddlefish is one of the last survivors of the class to which Tiktaalik once belonged. But unlike Tiktaalik, the paddlefish is in plentiful supply. Paddlefish is a common source for caviar, so we'd get our paddlefish from caviar farms. Intriguingly, even though Tiktaalik is extinct, the paddlefish is actually the more primitive form. Its fins bear far less relation to an arm or leg than Tiktaalik's. And because they are related, the two kinds of fish should share the same genes. So Shubin began looking at paddlefish embryos hunting for the genes that built its fins. And soon, he zeroed in on one particular group of body plan genes, called Hox genes. Hox genes have been found in all complex animals, from the velvet worm that dates back some 600 million years, to the modern human. And in all that time, the letters of their DNA have remained virtually unchanged. They are aristocrats of the gene community, near the very top of the chain of command. They give orders that cascade through a developing embryo, activating entire networks of switches and genes that make the parts of the body. They are absolutely critical to the shape and form of a developing creature. These genes determine where the front and the back of the animal is going to be, the top, the bottom, the left, the right, the inside, the outside, where the eyes are going to be, where the legs are going to be, where the gut's going to be, how many fingers they're going to have. Shubin found that Hox genes had a key role in the formation of paddlefish fins. One set of Hox genes orders the first stage of fin development, a sturdy piece of cartilage that grows out from the torso. Amazingly, in all four-limbed animals, even us, exactly the same genes create the long upper arm bone.
In the paddlefish, another set of Hox genes command the next stage of fin development. Again, exactly the same genes control the growth of our two forearm bones. Finally, the same genes working in a different order make the array of bones at the end of the fin. The same sequence of the same genes makes our fingers and toes. This was a massive revelation. Suddenly, the origin of creatures with arms and legs didn't seem such a huge leap after all. If the same genes were at work in Tiktaalik, then many of the genes needed to make legs and arms were already being carried around by prehistoric fish. All it needed was a few mutations, a few changes to the timing and order of what was turned off and on, and a fin could become a limb. Oftentimes, the origin of whole new structures in evolution doesn't involve the origin of new genes or whole new genetic recipes. Old genes, old genetic pathways can be reconfigured to make marvelously wonderful new things. So it is now possible to answer what Darwin didn't know and explain how all four-legged creatures could be descended from fish. Around 375 million years ago, a creature like Tiktaalik was under attack, harried by predators. But some random changes to the activity of the hox genes led to its fins, developing a structure like a limb. Tiktaalik could now haul itself out of danger onto dry land. On land, it would have found a world of plants and insects a world ripe for colonization, a world perfect for animals with arms and legs. And so, over millions of years, these new limbs evolved, changed, and diversified. Some became adapted for running, others for flying, some for digging, others for swinging. And so four-limbed creatures took over the world in a multitude of different ways. and all because of some changes to an ancient set of genes. And this is the true wonder of where our new understanding of DNA has led us to. There are genes that make the stuff of our bodies, switches that turn them off and on, and still other genes that give those switches orders. Together, in a complex cascade of timing and intensity, they combine to produce the amazing diversity of life on this planet. That, truly, is something that Darwin never knew. But can this new science also explain perhaps the most fundamental question of all? What makes us human? The scope of human activity is simply astounding. 
What fascinated me were all the crazy things that humans do. You look around the world, and if there's something bizarre and interesting that you could be doing, humans are up to it somewhere in the world. And when you look at all of this, you just have to ask yourself, what makes us special? What is the basis for this humanness? For all nature's wonders, the achievements of the human mind are truly unique. We are the only species to think about what others think about us, to punish those who have harmed others, to create art, music, architecture, to engage in science, medicine, the microchip, Only we can destroy millions at the push of a button. Hardly surprising, then, that for centuries we thought that humans were different from all other species, better created in the image of God. But then Darwin began to draw conclusions from evidence like gill slits in human embryos that showed that we were descended from fish. <laughs> but it was when he drew parallels with other close relatives that he got into real trouble. Shortly after Darwin returned from his voyage, in London, an orangutan named Jenny went on exhibit. And this was a huge sensation. This was the first great ape to be exhibited in captivity. And Darwin was absolutely taken with how she was sort of childlike in her ways. And he saw a lot of human behavior in the way this orangutan behaved. When Darwin suggested that human beings must actually be descended from apes, he was savaged. He was accused of attacking that core belief that humankind had been created in the image of God above all other creatures. But today, the idea that we share a common ancestor with apes is completely accepted in biology. Instead, as a result of having sequenced the genomes of both humans and apes, we face a very different puzzle. Katie Pollard is an expert on chimp DNA. Given all the obvious differences between humans and chimps, you might expect our DNA to be really different. But in fact, it's more like 99% identical. Just a 1% difference in the DNA of humans and chimps. The mystery facing modern science is not how can such different animals be related, but how can such closely related species be so different? That really is something that Darwin never knew. But slowly, scientists are starting to find the answers. And one answer begins with insights into the genetics of a key human organ, our hands. The human hand is a marvel. Nimble and dexterous, nothing quite like it exists anywhere else in nature. It offers us a unique combination of precision and power. And much of that is down to one particular digit, our thumb. One of the features of the human hand is our ability to touch all four fingers with a thumb. And that allows us to make grips like this gives us a lot of precision. The power grip is the ability to put a lot of strength into this sort of contact. So if you're holding a ball, you're basically pinching it. And we can put a lot of strength into that. The better to throw a fastball with, 